Recording in progress. Hey guys, welcome to the EOF Implementers call number 12. Uh, before we get started with the client updates, I wanted to just reiterate really quickly what we talked about on call 11 and maybe in the updates can mention uh, how uh, teams have thought about the stuff that we talked about last call or we can talk about it in the spec updates. But the points that I put on the agenda as a summary for the last call was that we were okay with adding swap in and dupe in. If something were to be cut, this is sort of the first thing we'd look at, but we generally like accepted this as something that we we're happy to put into EOF. Um, also wanted to reorder the data section to be at the end of the container versus where it is today. And then we also kind of left a note about talking about gas observability with respect to ERC 4337. Since it seems like 437 is very much the approach that people are looking forward to for account abstraction. And if EOF makes that impossible, um, yeah, it's important things to think about. So with that said, if we could go ahead and get started with some client updates and maybe mention how you have thought about those things in the past two weeks. Otherwise, we can chat a little bit more about it in the spec updates if we need to. Anyone want to volunteer to get started? Okay, Ayman. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. From Nethermind side, uh, we've been doing mostly cleanup of our PRs. We implemented Dupin, Swapen, and we've been trying to continue our drafts for mega EOF endgame spec. And we are waiting for the for the EIPs to at least emerge so we can see them clearly and update our code accordingly. And yeah. That's mostly it. Thanks for that update. Uh, who wants to go next? I'll go next. Um, I did some performance payments on BASU, but I haven't done much on EOF. Most of my time has been occupied writing slides for a conference next week. Cool. Um, EVM1 folks. Oh, Alex, anything to say from EVM ones? I don't standpoint? think any, anything changed significantly since last time. Okay, cool. Um, Alex, you said that your pressure was not to make EAPs yet, but keep using the meta spec. Are you just referring to what I said about the swap in dupe in thing? I probably just misspoke. No, I, I kind of responded to to Iman. Because okay, you, gotcha. you you said you were um, waiting for the EIPs before considering an implementation, right? Yeah, or... well, we are making a draft implementation, but we prefer the, uh, the EIPs to be there. Yeah, but for drafts and testing, it's, it's fine this way, right? Yeah. We, we don't expect it to be final before their EIPs, of course. Okay, I guess, okay. <laughs> uh, any other client related updates? That's probably, that's probably all. Any compiler updates? Doesn't look like anything. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's not like an official update, but I did have a discussion with Daniel. And I mean, I mentioned this, maybe not in the last call, but the, the call before that they, for prioritization within Solidity, they, they want to get a bit more confidence um, before they, they allocate more resources. 
Um, but we did agree um, that they will try to merge the uh, EUF1 implementation from December, which is like a complete implementation, but it changes a number of different subsystems of the compiler. And so the goal is to, to try to get that merged. And then also third parties can much more easily work on the diff between, you know, EUF1 from December versus what we have today. Um, I mean, right now it would be challenging because they have this massive PR for it. Um, yeah, they have this massive PR for it right now, and, and it's it's really hard to to have any third party to make any any changes on top. So the, the goal is to get it merged into mainline Solidity, and then um, others, um, even from this group, can potentially work on making the changes since December to Solidity. But if there is more confidence coming from all core devs, then um, Solidity is, is happy to allocate resources. Okay, awesome. That's great. Thanks a lot for that update. I think we can move on to spec updates now. Does anyone have anything to talk about here? Iman? Uh, well, I think I mentioned this in the Discord. I would like to suggest that we update our traces to include extra data like the immediates and yeah well at least the immediates and the current code section for eof so we can so what at least what basic did is we added the section when it's not zero um that for for the initial large EOF and I'm you know open to always setting the code section when it's EOF code and not set it with EOF code is a nice indication. But adding immediates, I didn't think of that and I think that's valuable and useful. Yeah, well, we've been trying to build the bytecode from traces and it was pretty much impossible with the new opcodes, the new the new multibyte opcodes. For push, we can deduce it from the stack of the next trace, but from for, for the other ones, it required a lot of painful calculations. So yeah, it would make sense to have them in the traces. As hex or, in, uh, or decimals? Uh, whatever works for us, I guess both work, right? Well, I mean, most of the trace spec is in decimal instead of hex when it comes to the text strings. So if you like doing an R jump, you would want it in decimal because the uh, PC is in decimal. Okay, then when we do them decimal, like uh, the format doesn't matter to us that much as much as they exist so we can deduce them or have them there to see them. And yeah, uh, the other thing is about dupen and swapn. I think the validation should be moved to the EOF validation context instead of just throwing exceptions in the VM while interpreting. So, and yeah, that's it. You're saying that the part of the EOF validation that happens on deployer executing init code should also check the validity of the swap and dupe in? Yeah, uh, uh, the current spec, I guess, uh, suggests that if the stack doesn't have enough elements for dupe and swap and according to their immediates, we throw either stack underflow or overflow and the stack validation in our EOF, uh, in, the e in, e in the EOF context, takes care of that. So we can just move those checks to the stack validation part and mm -hmm. proceed normally. Um, yeah, you guys, on the Epsilon team, was there a reason why you guys wrote it in this way, where it was a runtime exception versus a validation exception? Yeah, it was written before stack validation was uh, introduced. But okay. 
you know, as we agreed last week to, to integrate this into the mega spec, it has been integrated yesterday, um, including okay. the stack validation. Okay, great. But it, EIP hasn't been updated. That's um, right. Okay, awesome. Um, does that resolve your question? I'm. Yeah, perfect. Nice. Thanks. Excellent. Um, okay. Any other spec updates? Spec concerns? So actually on the spec update, Andre, I'm not sure if your mic works, but if it does, you work the the most on the spec. Do you want to give a, uh, an yeah. update on it? Uh, yeah, we made several additions. So Swapine and Dupin, as already mentioned, uh, are there now. And then we added non-returning functions definition and its implication for JumpF. I think JumpF was already there. Uh, but now, yeah, now it's also uh, mentions non return functions and how they're validated. Uh, and it turned out a bit tricky. So, like, the, the, validating whether a function is really non returning actually depends on jump Fs and whether they jump F into non other non returning non -return functions only or not. But yeah, it's better to check it out in the spec. And uh, uh, also, this is not a new thing, but we just kind of reorganized thing. We've added this tech validation section in the doc, and this is just for completeness, I guess. Uh, we moved some items from code validation into this, so they are now separate and uh, more complete and easier to read, hopefully. And, and also, I think since last time we changed the uh, uh, order of the sections now, data. Oh, it's not, not everywhere, not fixed, but uh, so section kinds are now four for data and three for containers, and containers go before the uh, data section. Yeah, um, so I think that's that's all I remember. Awesome. Sounds like a lot of, was added to the spec. It's great. Any comments on those updates? Uh, okay, Zane, do you want to bring up this discussion again about Xcode copy data contracts? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, my name is Zane. Uh, I'm just a community member um, that's like working in the ecosystem. Um, so there's sort of a largest group of us that have been using uh, data contracts. Um, and I was listening to the call from two weeks ago and it sounded like there was some sort of confusion as to whether or not uh, like what level of support there would be for data contracts. Um, so just as like context, uh, some of the larger people that use uh, these data contracts would be nouns DAO. So something like, I don't know, like 45 million worth of whatever in their DAO treasury. Uh, and then Artblocks uses it. And then there's sort of a larger subgroup that you can access. And I posted this within the EVM uh, Discord called Math Castles. And like Extreme Tom from Cool Cats, and a lot of people in the NFT space. And there's a couple of people elsewhere that are using data contracts. Um, and so I think there is some confusion because within the EIP, uh, it seems like there's a pathway to keep using Xcode copy uh, to retrieve data. And then uh, when I brought this up in the Discord, it seemed like maybe that's no longer like on the docket to be uh, supported, um, where the Xcode copy opcode would fail on a data contract. Is that uh, correct? Or yeah, am I missing things? And then finally, uh, a lot of us want to start migrating the code uh, over to um, start supporting S-Store. 
So uh, here is basically the sequence that a lot of projects use uh, and some sort of derivative of this, um, which is of course using Xcode copy to uh, reduce uh, gas and storing data within the code segment. Um, and so from the consumption side, what this looks like as a problem is that as more gas is used by the RPC providers, then the data doesn't actually get relayed back. Um, so S store helps reduce that for on chain like storage. So if you're just like using Infura, for instance, um, you may not get back all of the data. So from like multiple angles, it becomes tricky when um, you can't have sort of cheap immutable storage uh, or cheapish um, to return back. All right, so that's kind of like the spiel on, I was curious, like, does that make sense? And uh, what the general like sort of thinking is, can we move forward with implementing uh, changes to say like this S store uh, lib to reflect the current EIP or is that off the table? And I think there was some uh, confusion about uh, X data copy as well. Thanks for broaching the subject, Zane. Um, I think my understanding was that we were, I, I don't know, I haven't looked at this, the mega spec in a while, but I think the one idea was to have new op codes like data copy and that would allow us to copy the data from the data section of a different contract. Um, and that would provide like this similar functionality, functionality of having data contracts, but I don't know what the latest on that is, Alex. Yeah, I, I guess there's a distinction between, um, you know, using data within a contract versus um, you know, cross contracts. Um, so what we have in the in the spec is data copy, which is local to the current account. Um, so that you know that is similar to what we had with code um, code copy before. Um, that is um, going to be supported. Um, reading from other accounts, which was accomplished with X code copy. Uh, for that, we don't have an X data copy counterpart. Um, I see a number of different solutions if we decide to support this pattern. Um, there could be an X data copy instruction. Uh, the X code copy instruction could be repurposed um, if the target is an EOF account. Or uh, what I like the most now is um, this idea mentioned, I think, by Dano on the channel that there's nothing stopping data contracts from actually having uh, just a regular ABI function uh, which returns the data uh, the caller is asking for. Um, I think the only argument to be discussed here is what are the overheads, the, the cost overheads, right? Because uh, the, the main reason there's a preference for Xcode copy as opposed to anything else, because that is the, the cheapest. Um, and I want to, to close this out with uh, some random feedback. I've been working on pricing in worker trees. I was, my hunch was that, you know, maybe this data contract question will be changing in worker trees. Um, my current empirical findings don't support that yet. Um, data contracts will be um, more expensive than they are today because of the um, because of the the code chunking employed in workload trees. Um, but I was I was wondering, you know, what, what is actually a a correct pricing about any of these. Um, so I'm not fully sure at this point that data contracts, you know, in a workload tree paradigm, should be cheaper than storage because in the workload tree they kind of cost the same. Um, so I think that's something else to to keep in mind that, you know, maybe data contracts 
they're currently cheaper, but maybe they, they won't be cheaper in the future. And then I guess my sort of follow-up question would be, what would be the reasoning behind them not being cheaper? Um, given that, like, let's say a code copy, oh, oh well, two points, actually. Um, two things to just bring into the awareness. So a lot of, let's say, like DeFi and different projects are starting to lean more into uh, diamond contracts and proxies um, and essentially chunking uh, kind of a mega contract under one umbrella. So um, local data copy is probably going to be not as useful as external data copy. Um, just because like a lot of contracts are like starting to brush up against those limits. Um, and then the sort of other thing would be uh, from just like uh, bytes or bytes and bits or bits perspective. Uh, it seems like if you were storing data in the code segment and the cost is that like, it's not mutable storage, but immutable storage that like it would seem that the cost of storing anything in those segments would be like the same. Um, now, when it comes to reads, I could see that as being a thing, but I wouldn't say that CoreGAF is particularly optimized for uh, <laughs> the reading use case. And I think a lot of infrastructure uses uh, like indexing anyways from external systems, um, like uh, for instance, like Vulkan. Okay. That's my like my long and short uh, of that. Yeah. yeah, I think saying these are like really awesome questions. Um, the the first point you made that there are you know contract size limits. Um, I think those again originate from you know fixing DOS vectors, and with EOF. I think we are actually getting uh, a different fix to many of those those uh, DOS vectors. Like you know, one of the the, the early issue uh, why code size limits were introduced were the jump test analysis uh, to put a bound on it. Now with the UF, we removed the need for that, so I could see a potential that actually UF contracts wouldn't um, be subject to the same code size limits. So maybe you know. Um, you could actually have much larger contracts. Um, now there's one limitation there that the data section currently is limited to 16K. Um, and so that would be the limit. Um, you know, that's the limitation in the header. Um, and then just one more response, and I won't be able to, to answer all of your questions and want others to also speak. Um, but the generic response to why things are priced as they are um, you know, essentially the pricing of both like handling contract code and handling storage should somewhat reflect the, the underlying cost of the, the client. And today these costs hopefully reflect what the client has to do, but with Oracle trees, the, the work needed to be done by the client will be different than it is today. And maybe that will mean that you know, the cost of like data contracts will be closer to storage than it is today. Um, and I will pause here. Yeah, awesome responses. I think uh, like, you know, I think that makes sense in the sense that like uh, essentially you're trying to like price the storage and then maybe the price goes up or down and prices are always supposed to be dynamic. Uh, so like, I think that makes sense. I think probably from like the outside perspective from let's say the DAP side of things, it seems as though a lot of, there's been a lot of momentum towards um, splitting contracts just because like at some point you'll hit some limit and the jump desk uh, current limitation makes sense. Um, and I guess the question I would have is from the EOF perspective, um, there's like the code section and then there's the data section. And I think like people just looking at 
like storing data and the code section um, <laughs> is kind of the angle versus like uh, in the data section itself. Are you thinking that the EOF format will no longer like sort of allow that? And you want to have like a clear um, borderline? So um, yeah, we do very much want the clear borderline um, to make sure that code never hits memory, never hits um, anything that could be evaluated in the EVM. One of the reasons has to do with zero knowledge proof translations be able to take the uh, EVM and easily translate it into a zero proof system, um, zero knowledge proof system, and having to have access to the bytecode um, kind of makes it more difficult, but also locks it, uh, constrains the kind of transformations we can do on the code in the future if we need to upgrade to a new version of, EO, of EOF or if we need to go to a slightly different system for ZK proofs that has the same effect of the code, but doesn't have the exact same code. So that's one of the reasons why we want to make the code unobservable and why we separate the data from the code. Um, actually, with EOF, the data section 64K because it's it's two bytes. So that's more than we can get in in the contract today if we were to lift limits. Um, one thing that would be helpful for us to evaluate the pricing and the impact is to know for these contracts, how frequently do they call EXT code copy within a transaction and how much data do they copy from EXT code copy? Um, because the idea that I had of if you have a contract that's serving up data, you put a function in front of it that says, you know, give me your data, and then it can copy it there, and then you can get it back. Um, because even the data itself in some of these translation scenarios, if you can prove that the data doesn't quote unquote escape the contract, there's more optimizations you can do and more stuff that you don't need to bring along as you do the translation to make it more efficient. So if the contract explicitly says, hey, I'm exporting data by having a contract method that actually, you know, does the copy itself and then returns it in the return buffer, um, those are the sorts of things that, you know, the, the systems going, future looking systems um, know that this data is data that's meant to be shared and it can keep it appropriately versus if it's not meant to be shared, they can, you know, copy it as a constant into the code when it, they see it's copied in and just do all sorts of interesting optimizations to speed things up a lot. So when, when Vitalik brought these concerns, I was, I was, you know, a little annoyed at the timing of it, but I think ultimately he's right, because if we want to make sure that these EVM contracts are very future-proof, we need to put limitations on what can be shared outside of it and what can't. So if, if we knew how many times these contracts called EXT code copy and how big they were per transaction, we could gauge if the impact is going to be crippling to these contracts or if it's just going to be a slight gas bump. Um, I, it, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. I think it's going to be a bit of a gas bump, but I don't think it's going to um, make it impossible to call these in the ETH call type system with the gas limits. We'll still be under 15 million gas easy with these, which I think would be the uh, gas limit for most of these systems. I think some of them actually have 50 million gas. So, so the, the cost imposed by having to read through a contract method, I don't think is going to be bad, but until we get actual numbers as to what these, these would look like, we really can't, you know, get a firm estimate on it. But as far as if we're wrong, we can always add EXT data copy in and future revisions of EOF in a compatible fashion. But if we put it in today, we basically can never take it out. So that's, you know, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm biased towards not putting it on first pass to see if we can make it work out without it. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. I would say that, like, uh, for the most part, uh, a lot of like contracts will like launch data contracts today. So they'll use like S store to launch a contract that is like writing into the code segment a large chunk up to like pretty much to the contract limit. Uh, and then from there, uh, what will happen is a lot of these projects are like say playing around with nfts and things like that so the read method will stitch together multiple of these data contracts to then return back a result so it would be something like a token uri call and then you would see like oh okay uh essentially a series of xcode copies uh to like other contracts um that would be off the top of my head 
And then I think maybe a next step would be to try and figure out like what kind of analytics we can get on uh, this behavior. Um, maybe there's a way to look at the generated bytecode to just see who's calling Xcode copy. Um, but from the top of my head, it would be like generally used for marketplaces um, and exchanges like uh, along those, those terms. So you can imagine like OpenSea probably will have a read call to token your eye like ever so often or wherever like wallets want to sort of resolve this directly, et cetera. So if you could get a copy of the ETH call RPC against testnet or like Sepolia Gorley, I think that would be the best thing, you know, of one of the larger contracts, one of the more bigger ones. But as far as, you know, launching these data contracts, create three and create four have support for that built in because you say, I'm going to deploy this contract and it's going to be the little stub that says, here's the read method. And then you provide auxiliary data um, at the time you call create three. So you don't know your auxiliary data at the time you create the subcontract, but when you actually invoke create three, you will know this auxiliary data. And that's where they can load in their data into these data contracts up to the limit. So I think the current definition still supports this use case where you create a large you know, data known only at transaction time and deploy that contract. It's just that what data would go into the auxiliary data part of the create three and the create four calls. So it would be appended to um, the code that would do the ext get and stuff, and then we would read from there. So we could we can do arbitrary transaction time data contract contents. I I'm not concerned really much about that, but I I would like to see um, if you could send a couple of the e calls of the contracts or the, of some of the larger ones doing these. I think that would answer a lot of the questions about the actual overhead of charging another hundred gas per ext code call is really what it would come down to. Okay. Yeah. I think that that makes sense. As long as there's like some sort of provision, is there like any sort of docs on create three, create four? Uh, so like I can like shuffle that back to the various groups and stakeholders that are interested in these data contracts and we can kind of stay, I guess, on top of it <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word um, or like uh, start to build the test harnesses because as like uh, platforms are like sort of using this to launch like future contracts, um, it's kind of important for all of us to be able to like change with the times um, or at least yeah. kick the tires. Create three, create four or in the mega EOF spec. Um, not every client's implemented it yet. So it's gonna be hard to get the test harnesses out. That's the step we're at right now is getting the clients to implement these specific instructions um, I hope to have, I thought I'd have these two done by now, but I got too many interruptions. Um, I think EVM one has it, so you could probably test against them. Um, I don't know if there's geth code yet or nethermind code yet. Okay, cool. Uh, does anyone have a link for EVM one? <laughs> And then I think that would pretty much so answer it. And just the takeaway, so that way I, I make sure that like I've got everything covered. Um, we'd be looking for uh, to make Eve call RPCs with the larger contracts that are stitching together uh, data. Uh, and then I guess what would you? What kind of format would you want? Would you want like a markdown of like the results and like how you could call it so you could observe it? Or markdown would be fine. And probably all I would really need is just to know which contract it is okay. and what some of the interesting inputs are for some of the NFTs that they're looking at. I could probably um, tease some of the NFT data out of OpenSea if I just know which one of these contracts it is. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. I can like I'll ping out to Math Castles. And like um, try and coordinate with art blocks. I think Perp Hat may have some connection there. Um, and then see what's up. <laughs> yeah. That sounds awesome. Could I ask just one quick clarifying question here that's related to this that's been a little bit unclear to me from the specs that I've seen so far? And, and maybe it's 
in this mega spec and I just am too dense this morning and quickly trying to read it. Um, yeah, go ahead. It, is the, in the long run, I think like our outlook at our blocks is like, you know, we're going to have to update our storage contracts to, you know, be conformant with the OF spec, et cetera. I think the part that's been unclear to me is the behavior for like, it's, it sounds like legacy contracts being able to use legacy operations to interact with other legacy contracts will still exist. Uh, legacy contracts can't create new contracts, new contracts can't create legacy contracts. That makes sense. Will new contracts be able to read legacy information or is that part still kind of unclear? I don't know if I misheard you, but legacy contracts will be, continue to be able to create legacy contracts. Sorry, is that, I don't, is that I, I don't think new contracts will be able to EXT code copy out of legacy contracts. I think that's one opcode we're also removing at the initial launch. Wait, are you saying that legacy contracts deployed by legacy contracts will no longer be able to Xcode copy? No. New contracts, okay, yep. um, EOF, EOF contracts yeah. won't be able to read legacy contract uh, byte streams. Correct. Okay. Is there any like pattern there that is suggested as to like how to make that possible? <laughs> um, or is that just like expected, like a necessary kind of hard breaking case? So that's kind of a necessary heartbreaking case, but um, there's there's escape hatches you could do. You could write a helper contract um, that you would pass in, you know, the arguments for the XT code copy, and all this helper contract would do. It would call from EOF, it would call into a legacy contract. That legacy contract would have EXT code copy, and you would tell it, you know, which to copy from and bring it back. So you can kind of do an indirection to get there from the yeah. legacy contracts if you really need an escape hatch. And it's it's this pattern is why we're banning delegate calls from EOF calls into um, into legacy calls because if you delegate call into this escape utility, um, you could have this escape utility then call self destruct, which is something we're trying to totally keep out of EOF's consideration right now. Um, so the direct call and you can get the external ob observable effects and not affect your own storage. That escape hatch is fine, but escape calls that will change your storage based on legacy rules is what we're trying to avoid. So I guess the pattern is to like, you know, maybe we could standardize a specific escape hatch contract in one location on the chain that you could call these if this becomes critical. But I think, you know, with, with forward planning, um, a, a better practice might be when you do these data contracts to always put in a little stub that will serve up its data. So you can just call the data contract, uh, call the input method, and the data stub that says, hey, serve me up this block of data, and it'll return it to you in the return data. Oh, I see. So that will be OK. So like uh, EOF contract calling a legacy contract that then internally calls uh, ext co copy from a different le legacy contract, that will be OK? Right. If, as long as the contract code executing is legacy, you have full access, all the legacy codes, assuming you're targeting another legacy contract. Okay. Yeah, I think then in, I would, uh, yeah, I, I, maybe it depends on how people are using things like SSR2, but I, I would imagine like the common SSR2 cases covered for most folks who are deploying that as a, yeah, who are using that because you have the read methods there that you're interfacing with. You're not interfacing with like doing code copies directly. So. Cool. That that makes sense uh, and is reassuring to hear. I think that part has been a little bit unclear to me. So thank you. Okay. Zane? Yeah. So for that pattern, your suggestion is that we launch a legacy uh, contract proxy that could probably take in any of our legacy contract addresses and let's say a range. And then that will then call out any of our Xcode copy data that we need. So that way we can then access that data via method call to that legacy contract. Um, otherwise, you would be stuck in the water without, let's say, uh, 
a proxy to call from an EOF contract. Right. The whole two systems at once is 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 a pain point. And I think that's that's the solution as you would call into the legacy that is designed to help you with the pain point, which in this case is the XT code copy. It's just there's certain ones that we can't do, like we can't let you self-destruct your EOF code. So we won't let you delegate <clears throat> call into these. But a standard call or a static call, that, that should be fine. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Zane and Perpat, for being here and asking some questions. Appreciate you guys keeping up with what's going on on EOF. Uh, I do want to try and move to some testing stuff. Is there any last comments uh, related to spec spec updates? Okay, let's move on to testing. Any testing updates, questions since we last spoke? Yeah, from testing, uh, there are um, two pull requests still pending. Uh, they have been reworked in order to use the new UN validation format. Uh, this way, is reducing the, the amount of test files and making making it clear the reason of the UF uh, validation failure. So yeah, I think they need to be reviewed, but yeah, it is now less less we need to review now. Hope it it is that easier. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Um, if you get anyone had trouble hearing him, I could go you were a little echoey. Sounds like there's two PRs that have been reworked a bit into the testing repo, and that's been finished over the last two weeks. And now it looks like those things are just waiting for review to finally go in. Um, any other testing updates? <clears throat> From the Python. Python test, uh, sadly, there's no news. We've been focusing on 4804 at the moment, but um, we will uh, spend some time uh, in the next couple of weeks to finally get into updating the uh, tests for the Python tests. Okay, great. Yeah, I hear that's a pretty big EAP, so makes sense. Um, cool. Other testing updates? Okay, that's pretty much everything we have on agenda. Are there any other th things that we didn't cover that people feel like we should chat about? Oh, right, 437. One more quick question. Is a 3540 still being targeted for the next hard fork? Uh, what is the official status? I think right now it's considered for inclusion, but um, they've created another level of acceptance. And uh, 4844, for instance, is like accepted to Cancun, whereas EOF is only considered for inclusion. So it's still something that people are trying to make happen. But uh, I, I think personally, I think it's more likely for the following fork. But yeah, I don't know. People are still we're still working on it and trying to have it ready. You never know what can happen. It might make sense to put it in this fork. Yeah. Is the smart or correct thing for client applications to do to be like, you know, working on implementing EOF compatible solutions, et cetera, but like to wait to deploy those until after the hard fork? Is that that seems right to me, but I I'm yeah, sure. that, I would definitely um, say that's the right path. I think the right path also is like being here and engaging at this time because we want to build these changes so that they are supportive, uh, you know, as supportive as we can of developers who are building things. 
and it's useful to have this kind of input. So I appreciate you guys providing some of that, but yeah, I wouldn't deploy anything until um, it's accepted into a hard fork and the spec is like, it's pretty clear this is what is going to change. Cool, okay, that's what I figured, but I yeah, appreciate the confirmation there. And um, yeah, we'll just say like, from our blocks perspective, definitely wanna make sure we're managing this transition correctly, but also like having a spec for how to correctly use on-chain storage contracts is very exciting. So I'm, I'm really happy this work is happening. Great. Uh, okay, we got 12 minutes left. Let's talk a little bit about 4337 and the um, banning of code introspection, or sorry, of gas um, observability. Have you thought more about this at all, Alex? Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't really have time um, in the past two weeks. So no, no real progress. I'm not sure if anybody else had any any time to think about it. So I did have some thoughts about it. Um, so there's there's two worlds we need to worry about. One is the um, mixed legacy EOF world, and the other is the EOF only world. Um, in the mixed EOF legacy world, if if EOF doesn't have gas observability, that's not a problem, because you will write all of your um, bundlers to run in legacy. And the first thing they'll do is they'll call EOF code. Um, we intend to have legacy be able to call anything directly in EOF code. We don't anticipate any bumps. We'll probably smooth down any bumps if we find them. So, so today on mainnet, the bundler should just continue to work as is. Um, where things get trickier is in chains, layer twos, where it's EOF2 only. Um, and I think that's a bit further down the road. And my thought is the future I'm hoping for is that account abstraction will be a thing that will be built in locally to the chain rather than what is basically a, you know, a second class hack contract to, to emulate a feature that belongs in the protocol. Now, the upside of this approach is we're socializing and standardizing the whole user operation binaries, and we're proving market accepted to market usage of this. So when account abstraction is brought in at the protocol level, there will be existing demand and usage, and it will work, work much smoother. And I think it addresses the whole chicken and egg problem, um, the way it's working right now. So, so my thought is, you know, if, if it's going to be a protocol level acceptance, um, that that will be the long-term EOF only chain ru uh, rule is that um, it has to be done at a protocol level. And I don't know if that's um, acceptable to the 30, to the 4337 crowd or not, um, if that's part of the vision. But I, I honestly don't see how we can enforce gas limits um, with, with sub calls and gain the advantages that we want to gain out of banning gas observability. I, I think it's a hard, a really hard problem to solve that I don't know there's a good answer for without protocol integration. Thanks for that, Dano. Um, Alex? Yeah, I just wanted some clarification, Dano. When when you said that they can just use the legacy stuff, did you mean that uh, the legacy code going to create the UF code? That is the trick, yeah. Legacy code would need to be able to deploy an EOF contract um, via a user operation. So Why that's that one of the reasons. Um, is that for wallet create... creation? Right. What if you want an EOF2 wallet? Or, I mean, can't, or you, EOF1 wallet? Well, can't you just have another EOF contract that um, maybe is like permission? It can only be called by the entry point contract. And the entry point contract would call that. I guess it would be slightly different because your contract creation would rely on that address versus the entry point contract. But I think it could be like a small addition to the current yeah. uh, contract architecture. And I think that's also why I wanted to move to referring to um, create four contracts by hash instead of by index. So it's a bit easier to, easier to bundle. So if you need to combine the contracts and move them around, or let's say you're bundling up a bunch of contracts that are all creating the same contract, you could refer to it by hash rather than by um, by index. It, it costs you know more bytes in the byte code to do it, but it provides the ultimate flexibility. So, but I mean, I, I don't think this fixes anything because the 
So either you have the user having the ability to submit random code, right? And then either you go the legacy route where you can limit gas, but the code is going to be observable. Or even if you have like an EOF proxy, which creates it, ultimately, I think you lose. Yeah, I guess. So I guess the point is that you can limit the gas from legacy when you call the UF proxy, right? That That's the trick. Yep. Yeah, I guess that works. OK, so it seems seems like 437 will continue to work in these chains that have both the legacy context and UF context modulo, some maybe minor changes and additions. The big concern is these worlds where you have no legacy context, there is no gas observability in all the entire execution layer. And I guess right now the only real um, the only real proposal for dealing with this is saying just that this should exist at the protocol layer, right? And this I think is also another reason why I think we should have different op codes for call delegate call and static call if we're going to take the gas out. Because if we get it wrong and we decide the solution is we need to return gas observability, um, we can't just change the call semantics of those three operations. Um, so making like, you know, a call to a delegate call to or static call to or the call X with the immediate that sets the modes. If we put that in a different place and we figure out things don't work and we need to return the observability, we could just return the existing op codes. Any other thoughts on 4337 and EOF? I guess it's something to just continue keeping in the back of our minds as we go forward, because I know that that's going to be a question that comes up as we move closer to becoming accepted for a fork but we still got some time. So let's just let that simmer a little bit. Five minutes left, any final comments, topics to chat about? Okay guys, let's call it. Um, Thanks for coming. We'll talk again in two weeks. I'll set up the agenda issue and yeah, talk in EVM channel in the meantime. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.